Hey, this is uh, Chorazin, and it's just a few miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And, and as you can tell, uh, local stone was used as the major building material. It was just more abundant and, frankly, more durable than wood. And uh, these, the, these ruins are mostly from the 3rd to 5th century, so after the time of Jesus. But uh, being here and walking through this space gives us uh, at least a sense of what this town would have felt like when Jesus visited here regularly. You see, Chorazin was part of a triangle of towns, uh, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin, each just a few miles from each other. And Jesus did a massive amount of teaching and healing in this triangle. You see, uh, an international highway ran through here. It was called the, the Via Maris. And it, it traveled north through Syria, and then it traveled south down to Egypt. And so by setting up his center of operations here, uh, word would spread about Jesus, his deeds and his miracles and his teachings as, as people passed through the area on the highway. So uh, uh, to live here in Chorazin, was to live near the epicenter of Jesus' ministry. You were simply exposed to him like few other communities were. You, you saw more of him. You heard more of him. But, um, but greater exposure brings greater responsibility. And bigger opportunity means greater judgment. If that opportunity goes squandered, which is what happened here. And so today, we have a challenging conversation. In this series, Doubter's Guide to Jesus, we get to look at so many warm, comforting aspects of Jesus' identity, uh, Jesus as a healer, Jesus as servant, Jesus as friend. But today, we talk about Jesus as judge. Well, good morning, and welcome to the month of uh, October. Hey, those of you uh, who are worshiping with us at our other campuses, I'm just uh, so pleased that we get to be together uh, this morning as we launch into part five of this series called uh, Doubter's Guide to Jesus. And it, I, this is a 12-part series, so we are just about at the midway Point. And I think today we're going to have a, just a fascinating, a fascinating conversation. But uh, let's, uh, let's, let's begin our conversation today with one of my favorite characters in all of the world, this guy, okay, this guy right here. Now, Fred Rogers is not gonna go away for us. Uh, recently, a documentary came out called Won't You Be My Neighbor that Chris and I watched together, and I have heard that there's a movie coming out uh, about Mr. Rogers starring Tom Hanks as Mr. Rogers. So you're not gonna hear the end of it for a long time. So uh, for those of you unfamiliar with this guy, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, Fred Rogers, had a children's television program called uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and the thing ran for 33 years, uh, 1968 to 2001. Now, he died of cancer. Fred Rogers died of cancer in 2003, and so the program ran right up to the point where he was in steep decline with cancer. Now, Chris and I are watching this movie together, Won't You Be My Neighbor? It's a documentary, and his wife was talking about the point where uh, it was obvious that he was not going to recover. He was in his final days of life. Uh, he was preparing to face death's door, and he asked his wife a question. Question Fred Rogers asked his wife from his deathbed was this question. Was I a sheep? Was I a sheep? And Fred Rogers' question to his wife while he was on his deathbed preparing to meet his maker was taken directly from one of Jesus' teachings a teaching that occurred here or near here outside the city of Jerusalem. It is days before Jesus' death. I, I think it's two or three. I think he's two days away from when he is arrested and will die the next morning. He is with his disciples uh, across from the city of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. And uh, he begins to teach them. And one of the teachings he gives them, we know as uh, the teaching of the sheep 
and the goats. Now, uh, just as a picture here, uh, it's, it's, it's common as you travel the land of the Near East to see a shepherd with a flock that has sheep in it, but also has goats in it. But uh, apparently there are times when you need to separate the sheep. Okay, the sheep go in this pen over here and the goats, they need to be in that pen over there. And, and this is the metaphor that Jesus uses in his parable about a coming king, him as coming king that says, okay, you and you over here in this group. Okay, you, you and you over here in this group. And he separates people like a shepherd would separate uh, a herd into the sheep on one side and the goats on the other side. Uh, stories found in Matthew chapter 25. Let me read the opening words to you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and Jesus is speaking of himself and his second coming, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And so here is not Jesus coming humbly in a manger. This is Jesus coming large and in charge and sitting on a throne of authority and glory. And then it says, uh, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates what? Sheep. Goats over there, sheep over there. Uh, and then he will put the sheep on his right hand and he will put the goats on his left. Now this, my friends, is a story of judgment. The sheep in the story, he marks out for eternal life. The goats in the story, he marks out for eternal punishment. This is a judgment story that Jesus tells and he he is the one administrating the judgment, Jesus as judge. Now, let me just get something out of the way, right out of the gate. And that's is for many of us, this is a troubling conversation. I mean, already there are people going like, oh, dude, come on. This is why I bailed on church years ago because of this obsessive, unrelenting, God will judge you, God will judge you, God will judge you without a message of love and without a message of, of grace. This is why I bailed on church. Well, all I have to say is what, <laughs> it's not all I have to say. I've got about 42 more minutes of things to say. Uh, <laughs> But something I have to say is, 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 uh, is, is this, uh, what a perfect place to talk about this issue of judgment in this series, Doubter's Guide, Doubter's Guide to Jesus. Let's explore it together. But I just understand that if you have a friend say, hey, that church you go to, I've thought about visiting your preacher. What's he talking about this week? And you go, this week is on Jesus as judge. Oh, What's he talking about next week? <laughs> Jesus, his friend. I'll see you next week, all right? Now, my hope today is that as we go through this story together and as we look, basically we're gonna look at um, this Jesus as judge thing through three different windows. And as we look into these three different windows on what can be a, a disruptive, and disruptive and troubling topic, I believe that your affection for Jesus may grow and I believe that you find yourself greatly affected in your desire to love Jesus and to serve people. Crazy thing. This story on judgment has prompted believers over the centuries to adopt children that are parentless. This story of the sheep and the goats has prompted believers over the centuries to visit prison inmates. This story on Jesus as judge has prompted individuals to deeply invest in refugees and immigrant communities over time, over centuries. This passage on the sheep and the goats has prompted and motivated followers of Jesus who are doctors and nurses to bring better skill and better heart and better care as they walk through a hospital floor from room to room to room. I guess what I'm saying is let's look through these windows. Let's explore what's here. Don't be surprised if your affection for Jesus grows. Don't be surprised as we look through these windows if you find yourself deeply desiring to love Jesus more and serve people.
more intensely. So window number one, and we're just going to begin with this story, the sheep and the goats. Window number one, the sheep and goats. And so uh, look how the parable uh, begins. Then the king, who is large and in charge, sitting on his glorious throne with authority, he will say to those on his right, which are the the sheep, he's going to say to the sheep, come, you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom that is prepared for you since the creation of the world, since the beginning of time, God has had something for you. Why? Next verse. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the sheep, the people on his right, they got a question. They go, like, when? When were you hungry and we fed you? This is not an interaction we would have forgotten. When were you without clothes and we gave clothes to you? When were you sick and we came to you? And then Jesus says this. He says, uh, for as much as you have done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you, you did it. You did it for me. No, no, no. You see, you serve me by serving her. You neglect me by neglecting him. You see, Jesus comes to us disguised. You want to serve Jesus. Well, wonderful. He comes to you disguised. Jesus comes to you disguised as the third grader in your kid's classroom. Jesus comes to you disguised as an old guy in a nursing home without family. Jesus comes to you disguised as a new employee in your company that is invisible to most of the other people who work there. Jesus comes to you disguised. And you hear Jesus says, you gave me water. You gave me something to eat. You clothed me. You visited me when I was sick. I was a stranger. You took me in. People are going, what, what, when? And he says, no, no, I came to you disguised. As you did it, you, as you serve them, you're serving me. As you're ignoring and neglecting them, you're ignoring and neglecting. But as we read through that list there, uh, let me just kind of show it to you in list form, hungry, thirsty, naked, uh, stranger, sick, prison. Something I think is very helpful is to simply not read read these through the uh, our century uh, as uh, Americans, uh, but uh, to to attempt to envision this back in first century century Israel. That is uh, not simply what does this mean to me, but but what would this have communicated to them in their their culture? I mean, just take a hungry and the, 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 the naked thing. Uh, it appears to me that hunger among families in Jesus' day was a real issue, just trying to have enough food to feed your kids. And the, the naked and you gave me something to wear, you, you clothed me. Uh, see, in our day, we have something called mass production, and it has lowered the cost of basic clothing in relationship to income. Back in the day, everything is handmade, everything is handcrafted, and so clothing was much more expensive in relationship to family income. And so it's no wonder that in relationship to hunger and clothes and the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would say, listen, listen, I need to ask something of you. Do not be anxious about your life, what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear, because these two things right here seem to be huge anxieties among a majority of people back in Jesus' day. So I was hungry, gave me something to eat. I was without clothes, and you clothed me. That, uh, that thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Again, back to their day, you're going 20 miles. It's a, you know, I have been in Israel before where there's blazing sun, and you're walking or riding a donkey, I mean, hydration is a major issue. You say, well, that's an easy one. Just, I mean, if you got some water, give it to someone. You give water to someone, it's, you don't have it anymore, and you're on the same hike. Or there are uh, cleanliness laws in the Bible and among the Pharisees in the first century. I mean, if you hand your drinking jar to someone who's like on, on the unclean list, 
you take it back. You can't drink out of it be, without becoming ceremonially unclean. And Jesus is sitting at the well, uh, a Samaritan woman, and the Jews and the Samaritans, they had been on each other's hate lists for generations. And Jesus looks over at this woman, uh, and he says, may I have a drink from your jar? And she is shocked and stunned and she verbalizes it. She says, you are a Jew, and you're asking me, a Samaritan, you would put your lips on my water jar. And so this, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. There's just all kinds of implications for that that we really don't get today because we have automobiles and drive places and don't walk 20 miles in the sun, blazing sun, to get somewhere. This a stranger and you took me in thing, uh, again, there were, there were inns, a few of them, if you had the money for them, but often a common way to get put up for the night is you come to a village, the sun is about to set, you're not gonna make it to the next town, and you just hang out in the town square. And someone will walk by and say, you got a place to stay? And you go, yeah, no, we don't. They said, well, come stay at our place tonight. And they get you, you come under their protection. It's not just you're not sleeping you know, on a bench or a sleeping bag, you know, a blanket or something, it's that you're now under somebody's roof. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was sick and you uh, helped me. This again, there's a cultural gap for us because they didn't have hospitals. They didn't have hospitals. When you went to someone who was sick, it wasn't just to take flowers and visit for 15 minutes. It's possible that you changed their bandages or that you lifted their head and helped feed them some soup. And so again, you, I was sick and you came to me major league implications there. And I was a, a prison, a prisoner. I was an inmate and you visited me. Again, back to their day, my understanding of first century incarceration in the Roman Empire is you could easily die of hypothermia or malnutrition. I mean, they give you maybe a basic something to wear, but if winter set in and you weren't clothed, baby, that was your problem. And they might give you some crusty bread to eat, but if you really wanted some calories, some nutrition, you better have friends from the outside. And so again, I was in prison and you came to me. It's like you came to me and helped me in my dire situation where uh, I, I could, could have died of hypothermia and uh, you know, malnutrition had you, not, had you not come to me. And so simply as I go through and say, this is what their world was like, this is what their world was like, this is what their world was like, I just wanna introduce you to a complexity with this passage. And it is just simply that their world isn't like our world. Their world isn't like our world. I mean, even the hungry thing. I have a younger friend, he's in his 20s, on the West Coast. There was a park in his city where homeless people had a tendency to hang out, really wanting to follow Christ's commands in this. He goes to a grocery store. He buys a bunch of sandwiches. He shows up at the city park, starts to distribute the sandwiches. And a guy looks at him and says, well, what's that? He says, well, that's turkey. He says, I want ham with Swiss. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my young friend realized, apparently the resources available to the homeless or this community are sufficient to cultivate fairly distinguished palates. And so, I don't know how many of you have been walking down the street and someone comes up and says, hey man, can I have a few bucks for food? And in the back of your mind, you're kind of suspecting that this may or may not be for food. And so that even that I was hungry and you gave me something to eat is, is, is a little sticky. I was thirsty. I have yet to be in a building of Ada Bible Church where a car door flops open and a person crawls in going, water, water. Go, There's a drinking fountain right over there. Yeah. So I was thirsty and you gave me uh, again, clothing, comparatively speaking, with mass production, very inexpensive compared to back in the day. We have hotels, we have hospitals, and as miserable and awful as a prison can be, uh, we don't hear stories of people dying of starvation or uh, from hypothermia because they're unclothed. and un So it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. This is my challenge to you. Just because it's complicated, you better not ignore it. Because Jesus, the King of Kings, goes, you over here, you and you over here. As complicated as it is to figure out how to apply this, whatever you do, do not cross your arms and say, forget it, I just can't figure it out. It's complicated, but don't ignore it. 
And some of you are right now going, oh, Jeff, you see, America is just so wealthy. This doesn't really uh, connect with us. But I'm telling you, on a world level, we have the ability to step in and greatly assist, you know, de developing, developing countries and, you know, developing cultures. Well, you've just stepped into another level of complexity. Because now, one of the massive conversations is the conversation about, someone finished the sentence for me, when helping is, you haven't heard it. When helping is hurting. When helping is hurting. There are whole case studies on this. The earthquake that slams Haiti in 2010. Listen, over a quarter of a million people, over 250,000, maybe upwards of 300,000 people are killed in this earthquake. There is this outpouring of uh, affection and, and aid and resource from the West. And so common pictures that emerge are pictures like this, United States aid, rice, free rice, just come and get it. And all of a sudden you've entered the land of unintended consequences. Like how does a Haitian farmer compete with that? When you bombard any society with free stuff, whether it's free food, whether it's free shoes, or whether it's free clothing, the question then becomes, how does a regional wholesaler or farmer or shop owner survive when they can get stuff for free? And it's possible to try to help, but instead of helping, to hurt. Once again, this is a complexity. We're just, the goal right now is to try to get smarter in how we give in a way where helping is helping without these massive unintended consequences. But I just want to agree up front, just reading through this parable, there's a ability to go, look, it's complicated, it's complicated, it's complicated. I know, I know, I know, but we better not ignore it because Jesus said, you over there, you over there, you, 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 over here, you, over here. Because apparently, if we can go back to the list, Apparently, Jesus cares very much about people living at the bottom, sometimes through no fault of their own, who are just trying to hold it together. Apparently, Jesus cares about that, which leads us to our second window. Compassion and judgment. Here we go. He judges because he cares. He judges because he cares. Say it with me. Ready? He judges because he cares. Compassion and judgment. This is a, a painting. This is the 1850s. Uh, this French painter, Millet, and it's called The Gleaners. It's called The Gleaners. And some of you looking at that picture are immediately reminded of a story in your Bible from the Old Testament that occurred about a thousand years before the time of Jesus. And maybe even the name of a woman comes to mind as you see this picture. For some of you, this conjures up memories of the biblical character Ruth, all right? Backstory. Ruth is a widow. Her mother-in-law is a widow. After being uh, away from, Ruth is, is a Moabite. She's not even from Israel. Her mother-in-law is. Both their husbands have died. They crawl back into town. They are destitute. Ruth gets up in the morning and she goes out into a field in order to, what's the word? It begins with a G. In order to Glean. To, to glean means this. The harvesters have taken a sweep through the field, and now you go through to pick up any, uh, any grain that has been dropped or missed. There's one over there, there's one over there, there's one over there, in order to piece together a meal based on what was dropped as the harvesters went through a field. This is gleaning. It is hot, it is hard, it is dusty work, which depends on the generosity of the person who owns the land because they can pick up stones and drive you off their field. And the guy that owns the land is about to show up. His name is Boaz. And in the story of Ruth, I, it is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and this moment is one of my favorite moments in the whole Bible. It really is. Boaz walks into the field and he goes, who's the girl? Who, who's she? 
And his workers say, that's, that's Ruth. That's the widow that came back with Naomi in order to take care of her mother-in-law. And Boaz calls her over. Now, if I'm Ruth making that journey over to the landowner, I'm a little terrified right now at this moment. He says, listen, I heard what you did for your mother-in-law, how you came back and are taking care of her. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to do some things. When you come out in the morning, you look for where my girls are and you stay with my girls. He said, I have told my guys, I've told my harvesters not to lay a hand on you. And if you get thirsty, over there, there's some water jars. You feel free to go drink. She's from Moab. You feel free to go drink from our water jars. Lunchtime comes. There is a crew lunch. He calls her over to the group. They share their bread with her. And then everybody's sharing this uh, toasted barley that they're eating. Think Doritos of the 10th century BC. <laughs> Snack food. And he comes and just pours a bunch in her lap. She has so much. After snacking on this, she's taking it home to her mother-in-law at the end of the night. Every time I read that, I walk away and I go, why does this story touch something so deep in me? And I see where Ruth is and I see where Boaz and there's just something in the story that makes me want to be a better man to protect people that find themselves at the bottom. What does Boaz do? She was thirsty and he gave her something to drink. She was hungry and he gave her something to eat. She was a stranger and he took her in. It is very, very Jesus-y, way before the time of Jesus. But this scenario didn't always go well. It, it, just those words of Boaz, I told my guys not to lay a hand on you. What's that all about? Ruth gets home that night, shares the toasted barley with Naomi, shows her all this grain that she collected. Naomi, the mother-in-law, where were you? Where were you? I found a field of Boaz. She said, you stick with his girls because in another field, harm might have come to you. Boaz, I told my guys not to lay a hand on you. Naomi, mother-in-law, in another field, harm could have come to you. What happens to women that are unprotected? who are not from Israel, that are foreigners, that find themselves far from town in some distant field where their screams might not be heard. Travel with me. Travel with me to the desert. Israelites, they leave Egypt where they've been enslaved for generations. They're heading up to the land of promise. In the desert, they get the law, baby. God says, you will be my people. I will be your God. Let's talk about what this looks like. The book of the exit from Egypt, the Exodus chapter 22. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner for you were foreigners in Egypt. Don't you remember that you were a slave people, that you were at the bottom? Don't you remember what that feels like? When you get into the land of promise, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. You are foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of two groups of people. Do not take advantage of a widow and do not take advantage of an, an orphan. Dude next door dies. You never liked him anyway. He's got a 13-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter. I'll feed you. 13-year-old becomes your slave. The 16-year-old becomes your, becomes your what? Use your imagination. It's like God says, if, if, if they lose their parents and you take advantage of them, and at bed, they're going to bed and they start crying, and if they cry out and cry out to me, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to get you. 
I'm not kidding. Next verse. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. Well, what you gonna do when war comes? If this becomes epidemic in this country, when war comes, I will not protect you. And you're gonna go to war and you're not gonna come back home. And then suddenly your wife will be unprotected and your children will be unprovided for. And we'll see how that feels. God wouldn't do that. Oh yeah, wanna bet? Here we go. My anger will be aroused. I will kill you with the sword and your wives will become widows and your children will become fatherless. You will find yourself in the same pathetic situation that those people were in that you took advantage of. You go, ugh, there we are again, judgment. But he judges because he cares. He's like, look, not among my people and not in my land. I so need you to be a Boaz. I so need you to get creative in the way that you look out for people who are at the bottom and just struggling to survive. He judges because he cares. Here we go. The, um, the judgment is a flip side of God's compassion. His compassion and his judgment move hand in hand. Say the sentence with me, he judges, ready? He judges because he cares. If you're looking at that going like, that's kind of harsh. Jesus' judgment in the sheep and the goats is way more severe than that deal in Exodus chapter 22. Jesus' judgment in the sheep and the goat story is way more rigorous, way harsher than what we experience in Exodus. Window number three, window of guilt, mercy, and movement. Guilt, mercy, and movement. It was important for me to do that because if I broke that down, it'd be a five-point sermon, which is way too much. So I'll deliver the same content under one point. <laughs> guilt, mercy, and movement. Let's look at the parable again. Then he will say to those on his left. These are the, the goats. You need to leave. Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, this special room was especially prepared for Satan and his cronies, but you'll get to share it too now. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. The observation that I would like us to feel with a stunning blow is that Jesus' judgment is not based on harm that is done. It is based on help that is withheld. The goats had every right to go, whoa, 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 we didn't do anything. And Jesus would say, I know, off you go. The judgment of the goats was not based on the evil they had committed. It was based on the good that they had failed to offer. Is this making anyone feel kind of unsafe? Kind of un, un, uneasy? Because in this moment when we go, I'm not that bad, but maybe you're not that good. Jesus' judgment is not based on evil that is committed. It is based on goodness that is overlooked. And if this makes you feel a little nervous right now, I want to make it worse. <laughs> a parallel story Jesus told that actually occurs here. There's a picture that I took in May, and it's a place called the Wadi Kilt. It's a Judean desert area that is between Jerusalem and Jericho. And there was a road that ran right along that ridge between Jerusalem and Jericho. And this is the setting for Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. It's a fictitious story, meaning Jesus makes up a story to answer a question, but he anchors this fictitious story in a real place when Jesus begins the story of the Good Samaritan by saying, a man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho where he got jumped, mugged, and beaten within an inch of his life. And it's that 
space, that road, that stretch. But the story of the Good Samaritan comes as a response to a question. Someone's trying to corner Jesus. Someone's trying to trap Jesus. And so they ask him the question, what must I do to earn eternal life? Jesus doesn't answer the question. He flips it back on the dude and says, well, you've got the Old Testament scriptures. You've got the Jewish scriptures. What does the law say? Well, the law says that to inherit, to earn eternal life, I need to love God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love my neighbor as myself. And Jesus goes, yeah, okay, yeah, just go do that. Just go love your neighbor as yourself, and you will have inherited eternal life, and love God with your whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then the guy feels trapped. And he goes, yeah, 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 but who is my neighbor? I mean, if I can't actually win this behaviorally, let's try to bog this down in definitions and phraseology. Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story of the guy that gets mugged. He gets jumped on this road that's between Jericho and Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and Jericho. Uh, he is beaten up, money taken, but also his clothes taken. He's, he's left naked because remember, clothes were more valuable back in that day because everything's handmade. And so they leave the guy naked, bleeding, it says half dead. He's half dead beside the road. And you look at that stretch of real estate and you go, you're not going to last long out there. And as Jesus tells the story, a priest comes, sees the guy, and kind of takes a wide berth and, and travels on. Then a Levite, someone who also had some religious responsibilities, sees the guy and passes by on the other side. Candidate number three, and then a, and the room gets quiet and the bomb drops when Jesus says, a Samaritan. Remember, they had been on the hate list with the Jews. There's bad blood going back generations between the Jews and this. He says, a Samaritan sees this guy, a hated Samaritan. He had pity on him. He gets down off his donkey and he goes to him and uh, no hydrogen peroxide. So you put wine, you put wine and oil to try to, you know, uh, uh, add some, you know, antiseptic, you know, to the person's wounds. And then he binds up the guy's wounds. Then he puts the guy on his donkey, and then he takes him to an inn. And it says that he pays the innkeeper some cash. And then he tells the innkeeper this, I'm going to be back here in a few days, and when I come back, if this wasn't enough money and it costs you more, I'll make, a, I'll make up the difference when I come back through. Story of the Good Samaritan. And then Jesus asks the guy that tried to back him into a corner and trap him, he asked him a question. So which of those three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, which one ended up being a neighbor to him? Da, 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 da. Let me see. Uh, I guess, and the guy won't even say the word Samaritan. He says, I guess the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus says, yeah, so just go do that. To earn eternal life, just do what? Find people that hate you. Go out of your way in ways that are inconvenient and uncomfortable to give them the shirt on the, their, off your back to ensure their well-being. Just do that perpetually and you will earn eternal life. There's gotta be a few people looking around the room right now, just to the people around there going like, I think we're all headed to hell. <laughs> I really do. I think we're all headed to hell. Guilt, mercy, and movement. Next week, we get to talk about Jesus, the friend of sinners. Because the judge of sinners is also the friend of sinners. And the judge of sinners is the one who himself stood in the way of the judgment that had a bullseye on you and that had a bullseye on me. The judge of sinners is the friend of sinners and he stands in the way of our judgment. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and you will find rest for your soul. I will be the great physician for the sickness of your heart. I will clothe you with my goodness. 
I will set you free from the prison of sin that is killing you and destroying the people around you. And people who come to the cross can say, I was thirsty and he gave me something to drink. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was sick and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a prisoner and you helped me. Guilt is followed by grace and grace is always followed by movement. What is to transpire when we understand grace is just open hands and go, God, here I am, here I am. What matters to you and may what matters to you, may it begin to matter more to me. We have a companion volume to this series. It's uh, John Dixon, our friend from Australia, his book, Doubter's Guide to Jesus. In your reading this week, you're gonna find a couple of these statements. He says, those who have received divine mercy commit themselves to human mercy. Those who have received divine mercy commit themselves to human mercy. And then John also writes, the life of love, in other words, reveals those who have known the love of God. My friends, let's read these two together. Ready? Those who have received divine mercy commit themselves to human mercy and the life of love, in other words, reveals those who known the love of of God. This, my friends, is what we call the grace effect. It's mercy in and it's mercy out. It's being a recipient of God's grace, and then it is giving God's grace. I tell you, I just think a powerful question to ask when we wrap up our day is just a question, did I act like a goat today? One who has received God's mercy, did I act like a sheep? today or did I act like a goat today? And that was Fred Rogers' question on his deathbed. Preparing himself to meet his maker and he asks his wife, was I a sheep? In a documentary that Chris and I saw, Won't You Be My Neighbor, there's a scene. Fred Rogers is presenting it as a hot, hot day. He sits down, takes off his shoes, takes off his socks, rolls up his pants, puts them in a wading pool, takes a nozzle and begins to spray his feet. Talk about how wonderful it is to have cold water on his feet. Neighbor comes by. It's a police officer, Officer Clemens stops by. Fred Rogers invites Officer Clemens to take off his socks, to take off his shoes, to put his feet in the pool and begins to spray Officer Clemens' feet so that he can have the same refreshment that he's experiencing. Well, nifty story. Do you notice anything about Officer Clemens color? Officer Clemens, black dude, is invited to take off his shoes and socks and put his feet in the same pool. My friends, this was in the late 60s. This was, in our land, segregation still ruled. terrible divisions racially. And Fred Rogers is just modeling. He's modeling what one does in the neighborhood. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, even when your neighbor isn't like you. Now, I do understand that that wasn't on Jesus' list. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. You had a kiddie pool and let me soak my feet in it. But I believe what Jesus is saying here can unleash hundreds of variations of compassion for people without people. 
People who are on the outside that need to be moved to the inside. People who are strangers, they need to be treated like family. And so it is that this passage of scripture over the centuries has encouraged some couples to adopt children who are without parents. It has encouraged others to visit prison inmates. It has encouraged others to make deep investments in a refugee or immigrant population. This passage of scripture on judgment has encouraged doctors and nurses and caregivers over time who are followers of Christ to bring an extra measure of care and grief uh, and, uh, and grace to their daily rounds. And hundreds and hundreds of other expressions of loving my neighbor like myself, even when my neighbor's not like me. What, what a strange thing, what a wonder that a story about Jesus as judge can cause me, can radically affect the way I love him and the way I serve him. My friends, he judges because he cares. The judge of sinners is the friend of sinners. And the judge of sinners stood in the way of the justice that was headed toward us. This calls out a movement in us. If taken seriously, will simply never be the same. Let me pray for us, and then our campus pastors and room hosts will dismiss us one room at a time. Gracious God, I give thanks that we were here today, that we had the ability to absorb your word, to absorb your truth. God, just I ask that it would direct our lives, that we would see people that are invisible, and that as we love them, we would love you. We ask this in the name of Jesus who came here for us. Amen.